I really wanted to share some things out of the Word with you today. And uh, people don't know. Uh, I have a little flock back in Texas where I live, uh, about 20 people. Uh, it's called Last Days Community. And I'm, uh, I've been teaching and discipling people for about two years. Uh, we've had about 150 people through our program. And uh, I've kind of been, I'm not called as a pastor, but uh, uh, like I always said, that if, if your car breaks down and there's no mechanic around, you're going to have to learn how to fix it. And God will use you in capacities that you don't know you can be used in. I'm sure if some of you husbands have had your wives uh, gone off to visit, uh, in, I hope on good, on good terms, go visit her mother or something, go out of town or visit a relative, go for a wedding or a funeral, or something, uh, you've had to learn how to cook. And I'm sure it's been a disaster if it was me. Um, but uh, the Lord will use uh, people in different capacities. And I, I don't know if any of you knew, but uh, 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 any man of God, according to First Timothy, Timothy 3, that's in any kind of an eldership position should be able to teach. Um, First Timothy 3 gives the qualifications of an elder or pastor or bishop or you know, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same in, in Greek. Do have any Greeks here? Um, uh, but the, uh, the Lord laid it on my heart to share a couple of things from the Word today. And, uh, I know I know I'm, I know I'm, I know I'm known as a musician, but, uh, uh, I really, I really feel led to teach today, so I'm going to. Um, let's look to the Lord in prayer, okay? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're still speaking to us through history, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've expressed your will, your commandments, your desires for your people, and warnings to the world. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us this blueprint for living, Lord, and food for heart and, and our souls. We ask that your Holy Spirit will anoint this word and it'll go forth and, and like you broke the bread and it went forth and multiplied it. You'd break this and multiply it to your people, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the problem is I have two sermons. And I'm going to try to incorporate both of them. One's called Praise Without Worship. And the other one... What's the other one? Oh, yeah. Counting the cost. Um... The first one, I'm sure you understand what counting the cost is. We're going to go through that. But uh, praise without worship um, is a term I got once when I was, I was at a meeting, not like this, but uh, similar, to where there was a lot of praise going on. And afterwards, I mean, a lot of praise, and uh, praise and what they call praise and worship. And uh, then afterwards, uh, I hung around. And outside, and everybody was smoking cigarettes and was joking and talking about the big football game the night before, and they'd, you know, gone out and witnessed the girls and so on. Um, you know, and I went, well, what do you, what's the use of praise you, Jesus? Praise you, Jesus, if your life isn't praising Jesus. And uh, we're going to look at what worship is today. Uh, praise can be worship, but praise in itself is not worship. It's easy to sing, lift Jesus high. You know, it's easy to sing that. It is. I mean, you know, anybody can sing that, even if they don't mean it. I mean, how many people here went to Sunday school as a little bloke or a little girl and, uh, and sang hymns and you didn't know what the heck you were singing if, you, if we were a little kid, right? You know what I mean? You know, I used to think, you know, you know, that... The halls with boughs of holly. I'm, what's boughs of holly? You know, I don't know. Um, I used to sing all these, uh, you know, these songs. Um, when, when, I, when I was a little kid, we used to sing, Marching, you know, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, Marching as to War. I really saw these guys with, you know, guns, you know, and everything. Nobody. <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. And I was singing it, you know, Onward Christian you know, I was ready to get my helmet out and, you know, kill a commie for Christ. Um, <laughs> praise is really one thing, and worship is another, but they can be the same. If you have something to back up. Thank you. 
if you have something to back up your praise with. Now, what is worship? Let's turn to Romans 12. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1. It's right there between Genesis and Revelation. Can't miss it. Between the table of contents and the, and the concordance. Okay, chapter 12 of Romans, verse 1. I'm reading from the New American Standard because I'm a New American. Uh, I don't, this is what I use, so you'll have to follow along in whatever you're reading. It's okay if you use other versions. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And read it again. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, there's a lot of people that give God praise with their mouth and live for the world with their body or live for their self with the body or live even for the devil with their body. After all, we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're all relatives, they're all cousins, they're all working together, but they're three different battlegrounds. They all work together and they can all work separately. When it says offer up your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, it means just that, that your body should not only be the temple where God resides, but it should be the vehicle through whom God works. And it should also be holy and set apart for God in deeds of righteousness. Turn to Revelation 19. Now, what is a deed of righteousness? It's certainly not works done in the flesh or done in the soul or done on one's own accord. It's works done by the grace and mercy and power of God. Revelation 19, it says in verse 7, uh, one, ver one uh, sentence of verse 6, right before verse 7, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Now, when I first, when somebody first pointed that out to me, the bride has made herself ready. I said, well, I thought Jesus was preparing me. And the Lord says, I'm preparing you. I've given you tools. And with these tools, which is the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from sin, the Holy Spirit to empower you, the Word of God to feed you and guide you, the church to uphold you, to be there for you, to fellowship with, for koinonia, for joy and for sharing your, your pains and your tears. And uh, finally, the righteousness of God, which is in verse 8. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. Now, before we were singing Lift Jesus Higher, that, 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 chorus has always given me the willies, given me the creeps, in fact, because I like the second part. Jesus said, for if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. But lift Jesus higher. We're going to lift Jesus up. And we all think it's talking about lifting the Lord up. But what did Jesus say lifting him up was? Yep. Excuse me. I dance too. <laughs> what did he say lifting him up was? It says he said this to tell what manner of death he would glorify God. So when we say, lift Jesus higher, we're talking, he said, when he said, I'm going to be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he talked about being nailed to a cross and lifted up. Now, I don't want to lift that higher. I want to lift the name of Jesus higher. Yes, and I understand that's what we're all singing. But you must understand that there's certain things we take for granted as Christians. One of them is praise. One of them, one of them is praise, and we use it sometimes to emotionally build ourselves up and even take things out of context, like lift Jesus higher and say things that he himself, I think he'd be offended by the term lift Jesus higher 
When he meant it as death, when he meant it as pain, when he meant it as suffering, I don't want to lift his suffering any higher. I want to lift his name higher. I know that's what you all mean when you sing it. Praise God. Now, I know you'll probably never be able to sing that song again with a clean conscience. <laughs> but that's okay. There's a lot more songs that I can pack later. Um, my desire for being here today is to lift the name and the glory of Jesus higher, of course and to try and lift his pain and his sorrow lower. And don't you believe that he can't be sorrowful and hurt now? Because Jesus has more of a capacity to get hurt today than he ever has before. When he came to earth 2,000 years ago, he had a bunch of blithering idiots for followers. I mean, people who didn't know anything about the church. People who didn't know anything about the spiritual realm. People who didn't know anything about healing. People didn't know anything about worship or praise. I mean, the way you worshipped God was you went and put a quarter in a machine and got a lamb and killed him on the altar. You know? The way you worshipped God was you kept the law and you were righteous on the outside, and inside you were full of dead, men, dead men's bones. You couldn't really be righteous unless you believed God beyond the law, which what Noah did and what Abraham did, and even Moses and Joshua and Gideon and so on, and time would fail me as it would Paul. The whole thing is... Jesus had these people that were ignorant of spiritual principles. And he put up with them. He was hurt. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I'm sure he laughed. I'm sure he smiled. But, you know, the basic description in Isaiah is a man that's heavy, heavy, heavy hearted. Now, today, he's got people that know him, supposedly, and real. I mean, some people know him and some people are phony. They don't know him, but they say they do. And, uh, let me give you an example. Who can hurt you more? The guy down the street that you don't know when he goes out with a girl or your husband when he goes out with a girl? Who's going to hurt you more? When the, when the mailman comes to the door and, and tells you you've got an ugly face? Or your son when he gets up in the morning and says, listen, Dad, I don't want to see your ugly face again. I'm leaving, you know. What's going to hurt you more? The one you love or the one you don't know? What's going to hurt you more? The one you've given your life to or the one that's just a stranger? In other words, the heathen, the people in the world that don't know God, who are ignorant, well, sure, God's upset that there's ignorancy and that there's sin in the world. But it really hurts him when his people sin. It really hurts him when his people give him what the Bible calls lip service. You know, tonight the lip service will be at 9.30. Um, God does not appreciate spiritual... In fact, the thing that Jesus hated the most above anything else was religious hypocrisy. Think about it. When they brought the woman who was caught in adultery before him, did he whip her? No. But he whipped the people out of the temple and turned over the table. When, when, uh, when his disciples argued who was greatest, did he go out? I mean, I would have gone out and got... You know, imagine that. The night before you're going to die on the cross, your disciples are having a debate. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. Well, I'm going to sit on the right hand. Oh, yeah, I'm going to sit on the left hand. You know, I would have gone out and got 12 new disciples. Jesus takes the towel and washes his disciples' feet. You know? But he takes his tongue and he whips the daylight out of the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Just, I mean, look. The thing that Jesus hated, and he hated it with a passion, was religious hypocrisy. Evil done in the guise of spirituality, or ignorance, and, and uh, the blind guides, he called them. People that were propagating religion, but weren't propagating truth. That were spreading forms of godliness, but had no power, and then still were righteous and pious, and thank you, God, I'm not like that other sinner over there. I love in that part where it says, the Pharisee prayed thus to himself. <laughs> Told you who his God was. <laughs> oh, thank you, God. What I want to deal with today is this. I know this, this church is supposed to be a lively hopping church, okay? I've heard a lot of things about this church. Jack Hayford's coming here. It's good enough for me. I mean, he's a great man of God. And uh, I worshiped with you. I had a really beautiful time. It was one of the best times of worship I've had in a good long time. But what I want to exhort you to, and I want to encourage you to, 
is true worship. I'm not saying put down your praise. Praise all you want to. But let your body be offered up as a living sacrifice of praise to God too. Let your deeds, the fruit of, not the fruit, not only of your mouth and, and your mind and your heart, but the fruit of your body and the deeds of your hands and the deeds of your whole walking in the Lord be something that's a praise and worship to Him. For when Satan came before God and said, you know, and, and, and Satan says, where have you been? I mean, God says, where have you been? He says, I've been walking to and fro. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Job? Have you heard his latest charismatic praise album? Why did God tell, call Job righteous? Because Job had deeds of righteousness. Not just, not just faith in his heart. Because you can't have, by the way, I'm not preaching salvation by works. Please don't think that. I am not saying righteousness by works. I am saying that righteousness produces righteous works. I'm saying that it says in uh, John 15, it says, It is my Father's will that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God wants you to prove it. To who? Believe it or not. To him, to your own conscience, and to the world around you. He wants you to prove that Jesus is real in your life. Now, there were these two people. Turn to Acts. Chapter 5. There's a, there's a, a couple. They were kind of a, a team. Annie and Safi. Ananias and Sapphira. The first five percenters in the church. Now, we're going to read this story through. We'll read it through in my version. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was, after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. And the young men arose and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter responded to her and says, Tell me, did you really sell the land for such and such a price? She said, Yes, that was the price. Peter said to her, Why is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out as well. And she fell immediately at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Now, what was their sin? Their sin was not giving less than they wanted to. Their sin was not giving less than other people. Their sin was not giving any amount at all. Their sin was giving this amount and saying that they were giving this amount. Their sin was saying they were going to give all. Now look, God doesn't matter how much you've got. And he doesn't matter how much you give, as long as it's everything you've got. <laughs> really. It doesn't matter how big your gift is or how small. In the law of Moses even, it makes a provision for those that are poor. Instead of giving an ox or a lamb, they can give a couple of turtle doves or bullfrogs. It doesn't matter. No bullfrog. You didn't even know that. Um, God makes provision for the poor. Now, if Ananias and Sapphira said to Peter, listen, we want to join the New Testament church community here, but uh, we really like to keep a separate account and put half the money in there until we're really sure this is where God wants it. They could have even spiritualized on it. As long as they would have been out in front. But what they did was this. Everybody was selling their homes. Everybody was selling their land. It might have been a fad. It might have been, you know, it might have been some, some great, excited thing. Everybody started to do it. 
Um, it was it was really an incredible spirit of awe through the place. Miracles were being done. It was an incredible holy time in the church. And people started going, why, I know what I'll do. You know, I'll go out and sell the old 40 acres in the back, you know. I'll go sell the farmhouse and bring the kids down here and we'll live with the widows and the orphans. We'll live down here with the poor and the needy. We'll just lay it at the disciples' feet. And everybody got all excited. Ananias and Sapphira. Now, Ananias and Sapphira were members of the church. I'm sure they took part in the Lord's Supper. I'm sure they took part in the praise and worship. I don't have any doubt they spoke in tongues. I don't have any doubt they were present when many miracles were taking place when many Bible studies and, and sermons were preached, when many thousands were baptized in the city of Jerusalem. I don't have any doubt of these things. I mean, you know, you, 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 know, you can theorize and, you know, do all kinds of exegesis on it, but I'm going to tell you this. I believe that they were full-fledged, honored members of the church. You know, Peter didn't say, what was your name, Ananias? He knew who he was. He'd been hanging out with the disciples. He wasn't thrown out for, for being this or that. But this is what happened. This move swept through the church, and everybody was giving everything. And Ananias and Sapphira were sitting there one day in a meeting, and they went, Gee, Staffy, what are we going to do? Everybody's selling their land. I mean, you know, we got that three-bedroom condo up there on the hill. How, how are we going to, I mean, look, it's, it's making us look bad. I mean, everybody knows we go home every night, and everyone's living here. I, what should we do? She says, well... Annie, look, look, let's just trust God. Let's just sell it. Let's just do what everybody else is doing and just know it's the move of the Spirit. Well, I don't know. Uh, Shafira, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I got that much faith, you know? I'll, look, why don't we just, why don't we just sell, sell it and, you know, give part of the money and, and put some away in account? She goes, okay. No sin. No sin yet, right? So that night, there's an incredible move of the Spirit in, in the meeting. Everybody's just worshiping, praying. everybody's having a good time. People are standing up, and Ananias stands up and says, Brothers and sisters, the Lord has spoke to me today. He wants me to sell my house, and he wants me to turn over. Um, turn, I'm going to turn it all over. That's what I'm going to do. I was going. That, yeah, praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay. So they go out the next day and they put it up with Jerusalem Realty. And they, you know, they sell it. They get the money. It goes through escrow. They come out and he goes, what am I going to do? I mean, what, what am I going to do? So I was all caught up there in the Spirit. Now, that's, there's the big mistake. See, a lot of us say things when we're quote-unquote caught up in the Spirit that we don't really mean. It's not the Spirit of God telling us to say them. We go in front of people. You ever notice the people that when they're at a Bible study and the pastor says, turn to Habakkuk, they go... And they look at you and go, oh, you're still looking, huh? You know, or people that, you know, people that are always singing on their toes, you know, you know, right? Or people that are, you know, waving their Bibles and they're singing, oh, you know. And um, it says in, in Matthew 5, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Many people let their light shine before men. It's like they have a flashlight, you know, and you're supposed to be pointing it up. And most people go, you know. They're, you know, they worship God in such a way. What a mess this church is. Look at this paper. They, they worship God in such a way that, you know, they're in the spotlight all the time. Yes, it's the charismatic renewal hour with Keith Green. Here he is. Um, and, and many people try to present this spiritual aura about themselves. And this is what happened to Ananias. He's in the meeting. And it isn't the Spirit of God that made him say that. It's pride. See, everybody else had given everything. Now, there would be nothing wrong with him humbling himself and saying, I really don't feel like I can give it all now. You know, then he could have gone for counseling or whatever, you know, financial seminars, full gospel business. You know. 
But if, if he would have been honest and told Peter, because Peter says, wasn't it your own money? After you sold it, wasn't even the money in your control? Couldn't you have just given it? You know, it wasn't a sin for him to give part. I mean, maybe it would have shown a lack of faith. Maybe it would have shown a lack of commitment. But it wouldn't have shown deception. See, God would rather you admit you've got a weakness than act like you don't. God would rather you admit that you can't give everything than say, praise God, I'm giving everything. Well, meanwhile, you've got half of it behind your back. There's a principle of this. So anyway, they come in. So they, they get the money, and Ananias says, well, look, I'm going to go and bring this half into the church. And you go set up an account over there. Bank of Jerusalem. Open up a checking account, too. We're going to need it. So he goes into the church, and it's a midday meeting. You know, people are praying, eating. There's just, you know, it's one of those home churches. It's about 4,000 square feet. Everybody's having a good time. He walks in. He's got this, uh, you know, bag with a big dollar sign on it. Yeah. Praise God, brothers. Glory. Yep. I went and did it. I just, you know, God just moved on me and I sold the land. It was a hard thing to do, though, you know. But, you know, we all gotta, we all gotta be obedient, you know. Yeah. Hi, Thomas, how you doing? Praise God. Yeah, how are you? Good to see you. Oh, Peter. Hi, Peter. Well, here it is. Peter says, what, what's that on a knife? Oh, this is the money we got for selling the house. Really? You mean, you, you really gonna turn it all over, huh? That's right. God just spoke to me and that's what I'm doing. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the whole? Now listen. Now listen. Never did understand these things. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Ananias is shot. Who told Peter? Who told Peter? Maybe he's got a friend at the bank. Maybe he knows somebody over at Jerusalem Realty. You know, how do he know that we didn't, you know, get this much for the land? He drops dead. Not out of shock, mind you. Now, I asked Winky Prattney, who's a good friend of mine, as you know. I said, Winky, why did God strike Ananias dead? I mean, people do stupid things like that in the church every day. They don't get knocked over dead. I mean, why did God do something so drastic with Ananias when I know people who have lied to their pastors and committed adultery in church? I mean, why doesn't God strike them dead? And Winky says, whenever God does a new thing, and whenever he starts something new, he always makes an example of the first time. Very strong example. He says he always does something very strong and even severe the first time so that people can always point to that as a principle. I went, oh... So, Sapphira comes in about three hours later. She just opened up the account, did a few little shopping things, you know. She put away some, put away some food in case they were hungry. They want, you know, some, some uh, Mars bars or something, you know, and get tired of all this rice and soup over at the church. She comes in, right? She's expecting everybody to go, praise God, Sapphira. You guys, you guys, you just, you guys really did it this time, didn't you? She comes in, no one's looking at her. She goes, man, did I forget to put on my deodorant? What's the matter here? You know, everybody's just turning away from Sapphira. She walks up, and Peter goes, Yeah? Sapphira, did you really sell the condominium for $75,000? Okay, now, he asked her the price, the amount of money that Peter gave. He says, because Peter turns over, like say he gave half the money. Say that he sold the, sold the house for 100000 Well, he gave fifty and put away fifty. So Peter says, did you really sell this for fifty? She goes, uh, yeah, that, that was the price. Yeah. Who, who could have told him, I mean... Why have you agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who carried out your husband will carry you out as well. 
and she kicks the bucket. Now, how many of you, now listen carefully, how many of you have more to give God than you're giving? Raise your hand. Be honest. You have more to give God of yourself than you're giving. Then you would better not, under any circumstance, act like you're giving it all. And I'm not talking about money. I mean, money is one thing. I'm talking about yourself. Now we enter into the second part of the study, which starts in Matthew 10, counting the cost. I really want to make this point clear. Christians are the greatest actors I've ever met. They're the, they're, as far as they think they're the greatest actors, they stink as actors. I mean, they, you can look, you can see right through them. You really can. But they are always putting on this show and this front of how wonderful their life is in Christ. They'll never admit how weak they are. They'll never admit the lustful thoughts they've got in their mind. They'll never admit how much they're worrying about their finances. They'll never admit how, you know, they're judging the tie the pastor's got on. You know, they'll never admit that they're human and they need to quit being human and start being like Jesus. See, that's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you're going to ever quit being human while you're on this earth, but I'm saying that Jesus commanded us to be perfect and that's what we should be working for in Him. Now, the Lord Jesus has given us His Holy Spirit to conform us to His own image. And there's many people in the church that act like as soon as they become Christians, there's no more problems. And that is the biggest lie. And there's, and more people in the church believe it than I've ever seen. I mean, they're always, and I, and I'm not putting anybody down by saying this, but they're always claiming this and they're claiming that. You know, I claim it. You look up on a concordance and find the word claim anywhere in a Bible. It's not there. Paul never used the term, I claim it. Jesus never used the term, I claim it. Moses never did. I don't even know if, you know, Spurgeon did. You know? But it's not there. It's not even a concept in the Word. Because, listen to this. Why do you claim something? If you have to claim prosperity, if you have to claim health, that means you're claiming something you don't have. Think about it. I claim this. You know. But you don't have it. So why do you have to claim it if you don't have it? I have all things through Christ. I have his power to heal. I don't have to claim his power. I've got it. I just have to walk in it. I have to exercise in it. I don't have to claim it. That's not a teaching of the New Testament. But it is a teaching of the church today. And I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not singling out any people and... and I'm known as a stirrer. I go in and stir things up, but I don't, I'm not here for the, in the spirit of stirring. I'm not here trying to cause trouble or contention. I'm here to try to make you think. The Bible says that we should give all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. That covers it all, folks. That does. You know? Love minus zero. There's nothing that you can leave out of your commitment to Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira's sin was acting like they'd given it all for God. And they'd only given half. And they were liars. And we are just as guilty when we act like everything's a bowl full of cherries in Jesus. Glory. But it's not. It's not. Jesus is. He's in, he's in, he's in heaven. And he is our representative. We're seated with him. Him being our ambassador and our lawyer and our representative as he intercedes before the Father. We're seated with him in the heavenlies. But we need to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, how do you get a tooth drilled at the dentist? Very painfully. How do you get a tooth drilled? You go to the dentist and you go, Doc, it hurt. If you don't, if you know, imagine if you go to the dentist, you know, Hi. Anything the matter? Uh-uh. Oh, uh-uh. not at all. Uh-uh. I don't like girls, I don't like dentists, I'm fine. You know? People that don't admit they got a problem will never get rid of it. 
That's including sinners out in the world. You know what? If you cannot get a guy to admit he's miserable in his life, he'll never meet Jesus. The only kind of person that meets Jesus is an absolute total loser. There's only one kind of person that needs Jesus, someone who needs to be healed and uplifted in their spirit. If somebody's having a great time in the world, forget it. You're not going to get them saved. You need, you need to have, pray for the spirit of conviction to fall on somebody like that. They need to see how empty their good time is. If somebody thinks their good time is really a good time, forget it. They're not going to trade in a good time for Jesus. I, got, I became a Christian because my life was miserable. I had everything a person could want as far as... I had a... I had a uh, contract with CBS Records and, and uh, uh, CBS Network in, in the U.S. writing songs for $1,000 a month that I didn't, no hours, zero hours a week. I just got $1,000 a month in the mail for doing nothing. They just got my publishing. My wife and I could do whatever we wanted to. We had 24 hours a day to do what we wanted and the check came $250 a week, every week. Which, uh, this was in 73. This is seven years ago. Today it would be like five or six hundred dollars. Tax free. They didn't take taxes out of it. It was an advance against royalties. I got it every week. I had, uh, record companies wanting, secular record companies wanting to sign me. I had, uh, I had a local following in Los Angeles of people that would come to see me wherever I was. I had promises of fame, fortune coming in. I had a, a, a good marriage. I had everything I wanted to, but everything was like a styrofoam cut with the cut with the bottom cut out of it, holding it under a faucet. It would never fill up. My arm would fall off before it would fill up. I was miserable, and I admitted to God. I admitted to everybody else. I am miserable. This isn't making me happy. I'm nuts. I started taking drugs. I started looking into Eastern religions. What happened was. I was honest enough with myself to say, this isn't going to lead anywhere. This life is a drag. My parents were fighting. They're married for 30 years. My grandparents were married for 50 years. They hated each other's guts. I'd go over and visit my grandma and grandpa, and I'd say, you know, how are you guys doing? And she'd, she'd say, tell them to turn the TV down. He'd say, tell her to shut up. I mean, no, really. 50 years of marriage, they wouldn't even speak to one another. I went, is this what I've got to look forward to? I was 19 and going berserk. Everything was leading nowhere. And nowhere was leading everywhere. This is not my testimony. It didn't mean to be. What we need to do is see that we need to admit there's a hole in our lives. Just recently, about two weeks ago, I saw there was a real lack of personal discipline in my life. I know I get up, I just, we're staying in hotels, you know, I wouldn't make my bed, I don't have to, a maid's coming in, you know, my clothes are all over the floor, I'd sleep in till noon if I didn't have a meeting in the morning, and, and there was this lack of personal discipline. You know, Winky sat down and says, you know, you're having trouble in your spiritual life because of this problem in your personal discipline life. And I, you know, he says, get up and make your bed. I said, even though there's a maid coming in, yeah, make it anyway. So I got up and make my bed. Stupid, but I do it. And uh, and it's really, that, that was my, a weak area in my life during this tour, and even in my whole life. You know, I was brought up in a, uh, spoiled rotten as a kid, and brought up in a, in a society full of hippies. I mean, just, you know, bonzo, zonko, totally out in outer space with all these people. And, uh, and then when it led to nowhere, I admitted it. That's why I got saved between 19 and 21. I'm not sure where it was, but it's right in there somewhere. For two years I prayed and prayed and prayed, and God zapped me somewhere in there. Um, but when I was 19 years old, I was at the end of my road. Most people, when they're 19 and they're at the end of their road, they'll treat, try to find another road. And Christians, the same exact thing. The same exact thing. They do the same thing. I've seen them do it, and I refuse to do it, because I know that acting like things are great when they're not is not going to get God to help you, heal you, uplift you, change you. There are a lot of problems in this room. I don't know any of you, but God does. But there's a lot of problems. There's marriage problems. There's personal problems. There's people that have problems with masturbation. Taboo. There's people, there's people that have problems with pride. There's people that have problems with vanity. There's people that have problems with selfishness. There's people that have problems with backbiting and gossip and judgment. And I wonder how many of you admit it even to yourself. And then we'll admit it even to God. And then we'll admit it to one another. It says confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's Christianity. 
Now, I'm not putting down your praise, because like I said, I had a, I, I worship with you, I love it, but that sometimes is a cover-up. I see people getting into praise and then going out and being miserable in their life. They can't wait for the next praise meeting because they can escape into the emotional eye of it. But you must offer up your body a living and holy sacrifice. This is where true worship is. In what we do behind our praise. What we do when the church lights go down. The pastor will tell you, he has heard and known, and so have I heard and known, of great men of God who were great evangelists and great healers whose personal lives were a wreck. Right? People... Who, who were drunkards when they were off the stage. People who were adulterers. I know of gospel groups back in the United States where they'll, they'll come off the stage, they'll smoke marijuana and pick up on the girls and the groupies afterwards. I know of contemporary gospel musicians who I knew before I got saved. I went up into their offices, they were snorting cocaine and living with their girlfriends. I knew this. This is, this is, this before I got saved and I knew these people. And uh, it kept me from becoming a Christian for a couple of years because I said, well, hey, these people say they're Christians. They had, they had albums out and songs about the blood of Jesus and all kinds of things. And when they were on stage, God was glorious. Everything was fantastic. Hallelujah. But off the stage, they, they didn't live any life different than me. All they had was a crutch, a mental, emotional crutch called Jesus Christ. I don't have a mental and emotional crutch. I've got a hospital. I'm in the Jesus Christ hospital, in for reparations and renewal. Now, unless you start admitting your problems and faults to one another, this church will crumble like every other church has crumbled since the beginning of the church. Unless you start getting down and repenting before God, and repenting to one another, and really opening up and saying, look, I'm a crummy person, one, or two, I have a crummy marriage, or three, you know, I don't know how to bring up my children, it's a spoiled monster. You know, unless you start admitting, now, you don't have to admit these things if they're not true. But how many people understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so then we don't have the perfect church here, so we don't have to say that this doesn't pertain to us. This pertains to me. It pertained to Peter. It pertained to Paul. Read Romans 7. It pertains to a lot of people. And unless we start getting down, we're never going to have revival ever, ever, ever in the world as a Christian church unless we start getting down before God and getting revived ourselves. And unless we admit we're not revived in our walk with God, unless we admit that we've got weaknesses and sins besetting us, then we'll never get rid of them and we'll go around with that toothache with our jaw rotting in our spiritual heart and not admitting it because we're afraid of the little pain of the Novocaine and the little pain of the drill. It hurts to get worked on by God. It hurts. God will discipline us. And it says in, in Hebrews 12 that discipline, no discipline seems joyous for the present, but afterwards yields the, the, right, the fruit of righteousness. Now, this is important, church. This is important, brothers and sisters. This is the most important lesson I've ever learned. If you're going to be a Christian, it's going to do two things. It's going to hurt you, and it's going to cost you. It's going to cause you much pain, because to squeeze this square peg into a round hole of the Spirit is going to require some chiseling, some sanding, some reshaping, and ouch in your life. Your flesh is a square peg and the spirit is a round hole. And they don't go together until God takes out his plane and his chisel and his sandpaper. And I bet you if this pulpit could talk, when it was sanded down so it could be made beautiful, it would have went, out, ooh, ow! I'm sure if a tree could talk, when the, when the gardener comes to prune it, no, not that branch, that's my favorite branch. And it's going to cost you. Matthew 10. <clears throat> Verse 16, Matthew 10. If you please turn your tape over for the continuation of the message on the other side. God bless you. Verse 16, Matthew 10. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not be anxious about how or what you will speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what you are to speak. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. 
And brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by everyone on account of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who shall be saved. But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you shall not finish going to the cities of Israel till the Son of Man comes. Verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become as his teacher, just like his teacher, and the slave just like his master. For if they've called the head of the house Beelzebub, that means if they, to if they said that Jesus had a demon, how much more are they going to call the members of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nothing hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim and shout upon the housetop. Do not fear them who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not fear, you are more value than many sparrows. Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. Uh-uh, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own host household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his, his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life shall surely lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Now, this is a picture of Jesus' teaching. It's a picture of his teaching that we very rarely hear. You teach stuff like this, it makes you think. When I read this in the Bible, I have two choices. I either believe it or ignore it. It's true, it's literal, and it's what is happening in many parts of the world, in, in communist parts of the world. In Albania, in the little country of Albania in Eastern Europe, it's the only officially atheist country in the world. All the rest of them call themselves, they have atheist principles, but they allow a quote-unquote freedom of religion. Albania is not going to be a hypocritical communist country, no. They took all the Christians, they gave everybody 24 hours to deny Christ. Anybody who wouldn't deny Christ, they sealed them in barrels with tar and sent them out into the ocean. Pushed them out. Okay, you don't know this, but that's the truth. You can check it out yourself. In that country, if you admit you're a Christian, within 24 hours under the law, you're shot to death. Now, here in this country, or in my country, we have a problem. We have a lack of persecution. Now, I'm not saying that we should pray for persecution. That's stupid. But it's going to come. God promises it. It's one of the promises of God, and I claim it. Jesus said, everyone who desires to live holy in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's a guarantee. Now, what I see in the church today is a desire for people not to carry a cross, but to carry a praise book. I see a desire for people to not carry words of warning in their mouth, but to carry words of false peace and false joy for a world that's dying. The Bible commands us to go and warn this generation to flee from the wrath to come. Jesus said that. What are we doing about that? We are so busy playing church, and we are so busy enjoying ourselves. The same thing the church did in Jerusalem, that God had to scatter it through how? Through persecution. The church and everybody got saved. 3,000 people got saved in one day. You've never seen a revival like that, neither have I. 3,000 in one day. Thousands were being added every week. In Charles Finney's day in the eastern United States, in the Great Awakening in the 1860s, 10,000 people got saved every week. 10,000 a week. were. They went through five years later and they found whole counties where there was an un, one unconverted person. Not talking about a churchgoer. People that were on their knees praying and serving God. 
Thousands upon thousands went to the mission field out of that. What I see is a closed circuit church. I call it a closed circuit church. I see a church that's so involved in its own program and in its own interest and in its own good times. And the world around them is dying. You know what? I bet you that there's 99 out of 100 people in Sydney that don't know the first thing about Jesus. Would you agree with me? What the heck are we doing about it? I did a concert last night. There was 3,000 people there. Praise God. We're having a church service today. There's, there's a few hundred people here. Praise God. Are you really concerned that there's people going to hell every single day in mortuaries and hospitals and old age homes and even kids on drugs and, and traffic accidents? That girl last night was very fortunate. Not unfortunate, but she was fortunate that she didn't die. Many, every day there's people that die in this city through traffic accidents. And by the way you drive, I don't, I don't, you know, I can't blame you. What would you do about a fireman who fell asleep while the city burned? You'd get a new fireman, wouldn't you? What would you do, what would you do if you looked out a window and saw there was an apartment building burning next to your house? And there was a mother on the third floor screaming and flames were leaping out behind her. Just screaming at the top of her lungs and her baby's hanging by her arms and she's burning. What would you do? You would, you would freak out, you'd run outside, probably climb the wall to try and help her. But don't you realize that there's people next door to you down the street that are falling into a fire much worse than a physical fire could ever be? An eternal fire. How many people believe there's a literal hell? Well, if you really believe that, then you would do something about it. You would really do something about it. You would become so frantic and so intensely involved in preaching the gospel to the poor, to the needy, to the lost, that you wouldn't have time for barbecues. You wouldn't have time for a lot of these social, what we call fellowship. I don't like the adulteration of the word fellowship. The word koinonia in Greek is a very precious word. When they had fellowship in the New Testament, it wasn't for tennis and it wasn't for swimming. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with tennis. I don't think there's anything wrong with swimming. I don't think there's anything wrong with barbecues. But please, let's not associate it with true koinonia. Yes, you can have true koinonia while you're at a barbecue. I'm not saying that. I'm not trying to make a legalistic thing out of this. I'm trying to say this. The church is trying to have a good time while the city burns. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with tennis. And it's a blasphemous, abominable damnable thing. You can't have a good time while your neighbor is burning, can you? How could you have a party? Or even a, how could you sing, thank you Jesus, thank you, or hallelujah, while somebody's burning? How could you? You couldn't. Guess what? You're doing it. You couldn't sit and, and have a good time in Jesus while people were burning literally. But how could you do it while they're sinking into burning spiritually, which is more literal, more real, more eternal than any fire in an apartment building could be? It's going to cost you to be a Christian. And if it doesn't cost you to be a Christian on this earth, it will cost you an eternity in hell. Because anybody that says they're a Christian and doesn't bring forth fruit to prove it is just as phony as a plastic piece of fruit. You ever seen those plastic artificial fruits? Looks good. They can even make it smell like fruit. Bite into it, you'll lose your teeth. Really? We have a Christianity that's like a travel catalog. You go to Qantas Airlines and you can check out all the vacations they have, all the great islands they can send you to. That's the kind of Christianity we have. It looks great. We could even show slides of what it will look like if we go there. But we don't really go there. Some of us do. I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's not anybody I mean, even Paul generalized, said there's nobody else of kindred spirit than Timothy. And three verses later, he says, oh, yes, well, this guy's going to come too. You know, Paul generalized to make a point. And I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy. I'm going to say this. Unless you do what God says, then you are no Christian. No matter how many baptisms and communions and church services and songs you know, if you don't do what God says, you're not his friend. Jesus says, you are my friend if you keep my commandments. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom. He says that, not me. I just work here. You know? I mean, there's some people that wish that I would say it, that I was the one that said it, so they could ride me out of town on a rail when I come into some city. They wish that I was making these things up. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. 
unless you do his commandment. You are no Christian. He says, a man who hears my words and acts upon it is like a man who builds his house upon the rock. Winds blow, storms rage, waves burst against the house, the house stands. Everyone who hears my words and does not act upon them is like a man who builds his house upon the sand. Winds blow, storms rage, waves burst against the house, house falls. What's the difference between the houses? The foundation. Now guess what? The guy that builds his house on the sand can build a better house. He doesn't have to spend all that money on jackhammers on the lot. He doesn't have to spend all that money on the foundation. He just lays it down. You know, takes a bulldozer in, clears the sand, and builds right there on the sand. And he can have more money to put into the stained glass windows. He can have more money to put into a really expensive tiled roof. He can have more money to put into railroad tie steps and a beautiful garden. The guy that had to spend ten or fifteen, twenty thousand on the foundation, he has to just make a house that looks, you know, that's that's utilitarian, you know, that he that that serves his purpose. He doesn't have a lot of money left over to put into frills and outer garments and things that are going to make people's eyes attract. But when the storm comes, we'll find out which house really listened to the Lord. Right now, you're a, a track of home. Some of you looking fantastic. Right now, there's nothing to test your foundation. And I mean nothing. You're not tempted like the people in prison camp. You're not going under persecution and tribulation like the people um, in the Middle Ages that were put to death for their faith. You don't have anything really challenging your faith except the world flesh and the devil. That's enough for me now. But there's coming some storms, some tribulations, some persecutions that's going to try us to our very guts and roots. And then we're going to know if this beautiful house we're all living in called the church and this beautiful worship experience we have called fellowship is really worth anything when the tribulation comes. That's what I'm trying to share tonight, today. Please, speaking at night, I always say tonight. Jesus said, if any man wants to come after me, let him first sit down and calculate the cost. It hasn't really cost any of you very much to be a Christian. It really hasn't. I mean, even if you had to give up your family, your friends, your career, that's still not that much. Many people had to give up their, their bodies. I mean, Paul got beheaded. James got beheaded. Peter got crucified upside down. Bartholomew got skinned alive. They peeled his skin off of him while he was a living. Jesus said to Peter, when you were when you're young, you could go wherever you wanted to. When you're older, people will gird you and put you where you do not wish to go. Then it says, he said this to tell Peter what kind of death by which he would glorify God. What kind of death are you going to glorify God with? Let me give you a little picture. Turn to Revelation again. Chapter 6, verse 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar <coughs> the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until, listen to this, the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who were to be killed even as they had been, should be completed also. There's coming a time when the only way to enter heaven will be death, martyrdom. I do not have a martyr complex. I'm not looking forward to the rack. I'm not looking forward to persecution. I am not. I'm not a sadist. I'm not a masochist. I'm not looking forward to pain. I hate pain. I dislike pain very much. I don't like it at all. I'm not looking forward to martyrdom, but I'm telling you this. You better be a living martyr right now. That means die to self. You better be a walking dead person who's raised with Jesus. Dead to self. Dead to selfishness. Dead to pride. Dead to sin. Because unless you are, when the axes start falling, you will too. Reese Howells, learning, uh, what's his name, Norman Grubb, wrote an incredible book called Reese Howells Intercessor. 
And Reese Howells went through an experience in this book where he was interceding for a woman with tuberculosis. And God told him to intercede for her. And God taught him this principle. When you intercede for somebody, you be willing to take their place in whatever problem they are. So when he prayed for someone that needed finances, God says, don't you dare come to me and ask me for finances for that person when you have the money in your own account to meet them. So when he prayed for somebody, God, you help this guy. Somebody come to Reese and say, look, I need $300. You pray for me? And he went, oh, no. Lord? Yes, Lord. And then one time he's praying for this woman with tuberculosis and God says, she's going to die tonight or you're going to die tonight. Take your pick. If you want to save her, then you must die. And he sat and sweat. But Lord, I've got this ministry. But Lord, what am I going to do? I got, you know. He sweat. And finally he resolved himself to allow himself to die. And in every other case, now dig this, every other case that he'd ever prayed for somebody, the thing he was praying for to take off that person came to him. This was his particular lesson from God. And he knew beyond any shadow of a doubt he would die that night. Then God says, okay, now that you've died in your heart, you're more valuable to me living dead than dead dead. You were going, and then he suddenly he realized that he finally achieved what was what's called living martyrdom. He had already, he was so willing to die and so resolved to die, and every other lesson showed him he was going to die that night. That God didn't need to take his life. Just like when Abraham had the the knife plunged over his son, he, he didn't have his his knife up and goes, uh, "Okay, God, uh, I'm ready to do it now. I, I'm I'm really going to do it." Yeah. No, he was going to plunge it. God says, don't harm the child. I, now I know. Now I know that you really love me more than your son. Now I know that there's nothing that will keep you from doing my will. Because I've asked you to give me the thing you love the most. He asked Reese Howells, give me the thing you love the most, your life. Because he didn't have a son, he didn't have a wife. So the most precious thing was his own life at that time. And he really did, beyond any shadow of any doubt, in his mind and in God's mind. And God says, okay, you're more valuable to me alive. I'm going to keep you alive, but remember, you're dead now. Here's the thing, folks. I'm going to close with this. I love you dearly in Jesus, and I really thank you for having me and your pastor for giving me the service. I want you to take home what I said and pray about it. I could drop dead tonight. It wouldn't matter. Because this is the truth, whether I live or die. It's not my truth. What I spoke to you for to you today was the heart and feelings of Jesus, not mine. Because I'm not judging the church here. As far as I've seen all over the world, the church is the same. Playing a game and not doing what it's supposed to. How many people here believe? How many people here believe it's God's will to send more people into the mission field than are going now? Raise your hand if you believe that. <clears throat> How many people here believe it's God's will to save more souls in each city that are being saved today? Why isn't it happening? Is it God's fault? Is it? Is it God's fault? You tell me. Is it God's fault? God commanded us to go, didn't he? Didn't he? He commanded us to go. He said to go into all nations. He said to go to every, preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say every person. He said every creature. Believe me, there's a word in Greek for person. There's a word in Greek for creature. He made a distinction. He said, so that there'd be no doubt that you should preach to everybody, even no matter what kind of an animal they are. He preached to everybody, every living creature. Now, if God commanded you to do this, and it's not being done, it's not God's fault, it's not the sinner's fault, it's the church's fault. And if it's the church, and I'm, when I point the finger at the church, remember, there's three fingers pointing back at me. I'm not pointing the finger at you, I'm pointing the finger at us. We are failing. And we can't, you know, dance around in the spirit that went while we're failing. We just can't. We've got to admit we're failing. We've got to repent for failing. Then we'll have something to dance about. Then we'll have something to praise God about. God isn't going to change if we fail. He says, even if you deny me, I cannot deny myself, for I'm faithful. God is true. God will not fail. God cannot fail. He cannot lie. He never takes back a promise. But with every promise in the Bible, there's a condition. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. Everybody loves the second part. Ask whatever I wish, it shall be done for me. But wait a minute. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Every promise. There isn't one promise that doesn't have a condition. 
and to as many who believe in him, they shall inherit eternal life. Every, even salvation, there's a condition. You must believe. That's a condition. There's a big condition. And believing is not intellectually going, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. That's not faith. The demons do that. Yep, Jesus is definitely the Lord, and we're trying to change that. The demons believe. The other night, I was in Adelaide at a restaurant with Winky and the pastor from the meeting. A waitress came up, and I went and I witnessed to her. I said, do you know Jesus? She goes, oh no, I wouldn't want to know him. I went, what? She goes, you wouldn't understand. I said, what do you mean I wouldn't understand? She goes, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. Oh, you wouldn't understand. I said, well, what do you mean? What are you into? You, you wouldn't understand. No, what are you into? She goes, I'm a Satanist. A what? She goes, I belong to the Church of Satan and I worship Satan. He gives me everything I want and everything I need. Now, I've met people that were on drugs and weird witches and stuff that have been Satanists, but this girl was as, you know, honest as apple pie. I mean, this girl, she had a little ponytail and, and she was working in a restaurant, the nicest, sweetest waitress I've ever met in my life. I've never had a nicer waitress. That's why I wanted to talk to her about Jesus. I figured, well, she's got such a good nature, she'll just slip right into the kingdom. She goes, yeah. I said, well, Satan can't give you love. He says, you bet he can. And I love it. He gives me everything I need. This girl was so blatant, so calm about worshiping Satan. It just, it gave me the, it gave me chills. And, uh, I said, Winky, I said, I've never seen this. He says, well, you gotta admit, Satan's got a lot going for him. When you worship Satan, he doesn't have the flesh working against him. When you worship God, you've got the flesh working against God. You gotta admit, he says, Satan can give what he promises. He gives, promises a good time. For a while, because sin is definitely pleasurable for a season. The problem with Satan is he gives you what you want now and you pay later. The problem with being a Christian is he gives you what you want later and you pay now. So I'll stand. Let's sing this song together. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow that you forgive us for our blatant disobedience to your holy word. We ask, Lord, that you put the spirit of repentance upon the body of Christ in this building and in this city. We ask, Lord, that you convict each of us of the areas that we're not turning over to you, but, but we act like we are turning it all over, Lord. We, act, Lord that you can, we ask that you convict us of false faith and false security and false peace and give us real security, real faith and real peace. Lord, teach us to offer up our dirty hands so that you can cleanse them. And you said, Lord, in James, to cleanse our hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, wail, mourn, be miserable. And Lord, teach us to weep before you so that we can have the true joy of the Lord and give you joy above all things. In Jesus' name.
one being miserable. You know, it's too to wait for you. So that we can have a true joy in the Lord. We give you joy of all. Thank you.